Hey kids, Mr. Galvan again. Let's continue reading out of Esperanza Rising. This is Las Papayas, part B, starting on page 28. Here we go. Tio Luis and Theo Marco came every day and went into Papa's study to take care of family business. At first they stayed only a few hours, but soon they became like La Calabaza the squash plant in Alfonso's garden, whose giant leaves spread out, encroaching upon anything smaller. The uncles eventually stayed each day until dark, taking all their meals at the ranch as well. Esperanza could tell that Mama was uneasy with their constant presence. Finally, the lawyer came to settle the estate. Mama, Esperanza, and Abuelita sat properly in their black dresses as the uncles walked into the study. A little too loudly, Theo Luis said, Ramona, grieving does not suit you. I hoped you would not wear black all year. Maman did not answer, but maintained her composure. They nodded to Abuelita, but as usual, said nothing to Esperanza. The talk began about bank loans and investments. It all seemed so complicated to Esperanza, and her mind wandered. She had not been in this room since Papa had died. She looked around at Papa's desk and books, Mama's basket of crocheting, and with the silver crochet hooks that Papa had bought her in Guadalajara, the table near the door that held Papa's rose clippers and beyond the double doors in his garden. Her uncle's papers were strewn across the desk. Papa never kept his desk that way. Dio Luis sat on Papa's chair as if it were his own, and then Esperanza noticed the belt buckle. Papa's belt buckle on Theo Luis's belt. It was wrong. Everything was wrong. Theo Luis should not be sitting in Papa's chair. He should not be wearing Papa's belt buckle with the brand of the ranch on it. For the thousandth time, she wiped the tears that slipped down her face. But this time, there were angry tears. A look of indignation passed between Mama and Abuelita. Were they feeling the same? Ramona, said the lawyer, your husband, Sisto Ortega, left the house and all of his contents to you and your daughter. You will also receive the yearly income from the grapes. As you know, it is not customary to leave land to women, and since Luis was the banker on the loan, Sisto left the land to him. <sighs> Which makes things rather awkward, said Theo Luis. I am the bank president and would like to live accordingly. Now that I own this beautiful land, I would like to purchase the house from you for this amount. He handed, he handed Mama a piece of paper. Mama looked at it and said, this is our home. My husband meant for us to live in it. And the house, it is worth 20 times this much. So no. I will not sell. Besides, where would we live? Well, I predicted you would say no, Ramona, said Theo Luis, and I have a solution to your living arrangements. A proposal, actually, one of marriage. Who is he talking about, thought Esperanza? Who would marry him? He cleared his throat. Of course we would wait the appropriate amount of time out of respect for my brother. One year as customary, is it not? Even you can see that with your beauty and reputation and my position at the bank, we could be a very powerful couple. Did you know that I too have been thinking of entering politics? I'm going to campaign for governor and what woman would not want to be the governor's wife? Esperanza could not believe what she heard. Mama, Mary Theo Luis, marry a goat? She looked wide-eyed at him and then at Mama. Mama's face looked as if it were in terrible pain. She stood up and spoke deliberately, slowly and deliberately. I have no desire to marry you, Luis, now or ever. Frankly, your offer offends me. Theo Luis' face hardened like a rock and the muscles twitched in his narrow neck. You will regret your decision, Ramona. You must keep in mind that this house and those grates are my property. 
I can make things very difficult for you, very difficult. I will let you sleep on the decision for it is more than generous. Theo Luis and Theo Marco put on their hats and left. The lawyer looked uncomfortable and began gathering documents. Vultures, said Abuelita. Can he do this, asked Mama? Yes, said the lawyer. Technically, he is now your landlord. But he could build another house, bigger and more pretentious, anywhere on the property, said Mama. It is not the house that he wants, said Abuelita. It is your influence he wants. People in this territory love Sisto and respect you. With you as his wife, Luis could win any election. Mama stiffened. She looked at the lawyer and said, Please officially relay this message to Luis. I will never, ever change my mind. I will do that, but I'm honest to the lawyer, but be careful. He is a devious, dangerous man. The lawyer left and Mama collapsed into the chair, put her head in her hands and began to cry. Esperanza ran to her. Don't cry, Mama, everything will be all right. But she didn't sound convincing even to herself because all she could think about was that Theo Luis had said that Mama would regret her decision. That evening, Hortensia and Alfonso sat with Mama and Abuelita discussing the problem. Esperanza Pace and Miguel quietly looked on. Will the incomes from the greats be enough to support the house and the servants, said Mama. Maybe, said Alfonso. Then I will stay in my home, said Mama. Do you have any other money, asked Alfonso. Well, I have money in the bank, announced Abuelita, and then more quietly she added, Luis's bank. He will prevent you from taking it out, said Hortensia. If we need help, we could borrow money from our friends, from Senor Rodriguez, said Esperanza. Your uncles are very powerful and corrupt, said Alfonso. They can make things difficult for anyone who tries to help you. Remember, they are the banker and the mayor. The conversation continued to go in circles. Esperanza finally excused herself. She walked out to Papa's garden and sat on a stone bench. Many of the roses had dropped the petals, leaving the stem and the rose hip, the green grape-like fruit of the rose. Abuelita said the rose hip contained the memories of the roses and that when you drank tea made from it, you took in all the beauty that the plant had known. These roses have known Papa she thought. She would ask Hortensia to make rose hip tea tomorrow. Miguel found her in the garden and sat beside her. Since Papa died, he had been polite, but still had not talked to her. Ansa, he said, using her childhood name. Which rose is yours? In recent years, his voice had become a deep throttle. She hadn't realized how much he missed. she missed hearing it. The sound brought tears to her eyes and she quickly blinked them away. She pointed to the miniature pink blooms with delicate stems that climbed up the trellises. And where is mine? Asked Miguel, nudging her like he did when they were younger and told each other everything. Esperanza smiled and pointed to the orange sunburst next to it. They had been young children that day Papa had planted each one for them. What does it all mean, Miguel? There are rumors in town that Luis intends to take over the ranch one way or another. Now that it seems true, we'll probably leave for the United States to work. Esperanza shook her head as if to say no. She could not imagine leaving without Hortensia, Alfonso, and Miguel. My father and I have lost faith in our country. We were born servants here and no matter how hard we work, we will always be servants. Your father was a good man. He gave us a small piece of land in a cabin, but your uncles, you know their reputation. They would take it all away and treat us like animals. We will not work for them. The work is hard in the United States, but at least there we have a chance to be more than servants. But Mama and Abuelita, they need, we need you. My father says we won't leave until it is necessary. He reached over and took her hand. I'm sorry about your papa. His touch was warm and Esperanza's heart skipped. 
She looked at her hand in his and felt the color rushing to her face. Surprised at her own blush, she pulled away from him. She stood and stared at the roses. An awkward silence built the wall between them. She glanced quickly at him. He was still looking at her with eyes full of hurt. Before Miguel left her there, he said softly, you were right, Esperanza. In Mexico, we stand on different sides of the river. Esperanza went up to her room thinking that nothing seemed right. She walked slowly around her bed, running her hand over her finely carved posts. She counted the dolls lined up on her dresser, 13, one for each birthday. When Papa was alive, everything was in order, like the dolls lined up in a row. She put on a long cotton nightgown with hand-sewn lace picked up the new doll and walked to the open window. Looking out over the valley, she wondered where they would go if they had to live somewhere else. They had no other family except Abuelita's sisters, and they were nuns in a convent. I won't ever leave here, she whispered. A sudden breeze carried a familiar pungent smell. She looked down into the courtyard and saw the wooden box still on the patio. It held the papayas from Senor Rodriguez, the ones the papa had ordered. That should have been served on her birthday. The overripe sweetness now pervaded the air with each breath of wind. She crawled into bed beneath the linens edged with lace. Hugging the doll, she tried to sleep, but her thoughts kept returning to Theo Luis. She felt sick at the thought of a mob marrying him. Of course she had told him no. She took a deep breath, still smelling the papayas and papa's sweet intentions. Why did papa have to die? Why did he leave me and mama? She closed her eyes tight and did what she tried to do each night. She tried to find the dream, the one where papa was singing the birthday song. 